You're sitting at like 5,000 plus followers on, on Twitter. That's pretty awesome. The momentum that Framer enabled when they launched, everything changed for me. I went more serious into this game, started my Twitter journey. I got obsessed with their tool, started to post way more stuff related to Framer. And that actually enabled probably everything that I'm working on right now. My design journey started in secondary school, that is, I'm based in Switzerland, Europe, 15 years ago. Created my first website about 15 years. Started an apprenticeship, which is more or less the only way here in Switzerland to go into like a normal job. And so I did that for four years. So it starts at around seven, eight hundred bucks a month. And in, in the last year or fourth year, it's yeah, around one and a half K. This apprenticeship got me basically into web design, UX design, UI design, and things like that. So these got me into I would say, yeah, in this space. And I uh, yeah, started to work with agencies right after this apprenticeship. It seems like there's a pattern I'm starting to notice with your template. What does it take to make a great firm template? First. How's it going? Yes. <laughs> yeah, really good. <laughs> Pretty busy. But yeah, happy to be on here. Thanks busy for with what? me. Sorry? Busy with what? Yeah, so actually all kinds of stuff. So of course, a few of my personal businesses, which all are related <laughs> to Framer. Uh, Welcome so, to those. Yes, <laughs> definitely. So yeah, I recently launched my course. So also busy with that, extending that a little bit with some free resources. Then I got a bunch of freelance work and also working on a new template. Yeah, I think that's it for now. So. Well, congrats Quite a lot. on launching the course. Thanks a lot. <laughs> it's a big deal. It's a big deal. We'd like to do the same as well. Pascal and I, I have an idea for something I wanted to do in that space, but I think I'm going to start to, I hate saying it publicly, but start to disassociate a little bit to Framer because it's just it's so saturated and everyone's so much better and spends so much time on it than I do. I can't get involved unless I'm at like your level or Clara or Alex or whoever. You guys are like all in it and I love it and I want to get into that today so like I told you I didn't have questions written and then you said that and I was like probably should have at least a direction of things to talk about so then I decided okay let me write down some things and they're similar to if those who don't know we interviewed Cedric that's how you pronounce the name right Cedric uh, we interviewed we interviewed you on our everythingframer.com website, which is a resource for all things Framer. You can go grab it, grab some stuff from there if you wanted to when we publish more of that. But we also have this thing on that, which is like interviews of mentors that we admire in the industry and want to help highlight and elevate them. So please check out those interviews. It's everythingframer.com slash mentors. Okay, so let's get right into it. I want to hear a little bit more detail about your beginnings and how you got into design and then specifically Framer. So let's start there and then I'll jump in with more questions. Yeah, sure. My design journey started in, yeah, actually in school. So I was in secondary school that is, I'm based in Switzerland, Europe. So this is, I think, middle school. So like uh, in, in between the age of 12 and 15. And so, yeah, I had... We had some kind of end projects for this grade. And um, yeah, we had like in uh, in ICT, which was like a, like a, a lesson we had uh, each week. Um, I started to, yeah, like we, we just had some basic, let's say, programming, let, let's like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So really high level. And so, yeah, as for some reason, I started to like that a lot. And then we also got into Photoshop. So this is, I don't know, yeah, probably around six, yeah, 15 years ago, or maybe even more, I'm not sure. <laughs> and yeah, so I got really excited with those topics. And then as my final project, I built or coded and designed myself my first website at the age of, yeah, about 15 years. So... 15 years old, started or created my first website. 
back then, of course, it was just plain HTML, CSS, and not really much logic. So it's really like just pure visual. But then, yeah, these things got me so excited that I yeah started an apprenticeship, So which is more or less the only way here in Switzerland to to go into a normal job. And so I did that for four years. And uh, okay, sorry, but so, so, pause right there. You have to do an apprenticeship for four years. Is that paid? It is paid, not so well, but I think uh, so. It starts at around seven, eight hundred bucks a month, and in in the last year or fourth year, it's yeah around one and a half k. So it's fine. It's not so much, but of course, normally <laughs> in that age, you're still living at home, which I right. partially also did, but moved out with seventeen years, so also quite early. But yeah, so when this apprenticeship had like various topics, so one of course was design. The other one was like technology. So really much based on web technology and photography. And so quite, quite a good mix of yeah, a few important things that still, yeah, accompany me every day uh, or nowadays. And so let's say these yeah, this apprenticeship got me basically into the whole screen design, or of course, back then it was called screen design. Now it's not really, now it's maybe more web design, UX design, UI design, things like that. So these got me into, I would say, yeah, in this space. And I yeah started to work at agencies right after this apprenticeship. Did this for yeah, around nine to 10 years. And yeah, there I really went into the rabbit hole, extended like my skill set completely to other software parts like SaaS and stuff like that, or just UX and UI design and product design, which is, I would say, my main focus today. So of course, because of no code, I am doing a lot of web design or web development too, but I would say my main focus of the last years was actually digital product design. And yeah, next to this job, I also did further education. So I did a master in human computer interaction design, which is basically like the UX, but also visual design part of of digital products. And I would say this is like the, yeah, the moment where I gained a lot of experience when it comes to user-centered design. And yeah, then I just worked, worked many years in that field and yeah, and still do. And now since I would say five, six years, I discovered yeah, this whole no code space, which started with Webflow in my journey. So I yeah, am working five plus years in Webflow already. Of course, a new framer from a screen design or UI design tool back then too. But yeah, as you might know, framer is or was not really in this sector back then. And then, yeah, like one and a half years later. They launched and everything changed for me. <laughs> what do you think is different now than it was beforehand? You mean in in which sense or which in direction? your life? I'm not sure if it's like the momentum that Framer enabled when they launched. And I like because when I started to work with Webflow projects and stuff like that, they, they are like 14 years on the market already. And of course there was some kind of momentum in six years ago, but the space was way more crowded and yeah, it's also way harder to, and maybe it's not so hard, but for some reason I, yeah, I started like my Twitter journey, maybe what is this a little more than a year ago where, yeah, I would say I went more serious into this game and yeah, I don't know, since Framer launched, I got yeah, obsessed with their tool. And also started to post way more stuff, which is related to Framer. And maybe that's also what led me into this Twitter growth. And that actually enabled probably everything that I'm working on right now. And yeah, I would say that's maybe was like the point of change. Because before, yeah, I mean, I work at the, worked at an agency and stuff like that. Maybe did a few side projects in Webflow, but nothing more serious. And so I you're, you're sitting at like... 5,000 plus followers on Twitter. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, I think so. So that, yeah, that's probably, yeah, big thanks to, 
to Framer because they are existence, but maybe I also caught the right moment or momentum with it. And yeah, went all in, as you already said in the beginning. And I think, yeah, this definitely changed a lot. And yeah. So can, I, can I ask how much of your time is dedicated towards Framer related things? This depends a lot on the products or on the projects that I have on the side. So like I'm is like, Framer your main thing that you're working on right now? Like all these Framer templates and these resources for Framer? I think everything, yeah, when it comes to them is definitely, yeah, completely Framer related. But there, of course, there are quite a few products and also projects that are like only product design. But I'd say right now it is really Framer heavy. But that's also good because I think my, that's also what my goal is with these templates. It is actually yeah, to build like an ecosystem of tools. So I see my templates not only as a template and a website, I more try to build tools, like actual tools to build stuff with it. So like the newest one that I'm working on right now is since I launched my own course, I know how to build a membership site. Or I know that also like mm -hmm. way back early when I launched God over a year ago. But now I think got really serious into building a membership site and also having lesson status and stuff like that connected to Outsetter, which is like this membership technology and everything is hosted in Framer. And so, yeah, that's what I'm doing quite often is that I first build something for myself, see if it works. Also like seeing what the echo is from the audience or from my community. And then if the echo is positive, which now is again true for this mm -hmm. course template is that the next step is always to lift the quality up again and make a template out of it. And I think that's, yeah, that happened like maybe, maybe on all templates except two, but those two were also like really marketing or portfolio websites and all the other ones are always, uh, yeah, were born through real products from my businesses and that's maybe also why they are so successful because people often actually see or use the product first and then just see, oh, that's actually purchasable. And yeah, I think that's something that I'm doing a lot and yeah, seems to work quite well. So yeah. what I have a lot of questions about this now. So I want to get into the course stuff because I also want to do courses, but I don't want to do them on Framer. I want to incorporate Framer but I don't want to do it the same path that you're taking on it. But I think there's a lot of things you can learn from you about creating courses. But I want to talk briefly about what does it take to make a great framer template? Because it seems like there's like a pattern. I'm starting to notice like what you just mentioned with your templates. Like you, you test the waters by creating something for yourself. And then you see what other people think about it. If it gets a lot of rea reactions to it, then you invest more heavily, raise the quality, and then you, you basically productize whatever you're actually almost like a productizing inception where you're like, you're <laughs> making a course, but then you made a course page that, that you can buy so that you can make your own course. So it's very cyclical and very, very much like you're recycling a lot of what you're doing and profiting off of that. So is that the framework that you're using or is there more to it than that? Yeah, so... I think I, I would say that this is just like a good way of validating an idea because you see that if it works usually on an own business, chances are really high that it is also working for other ones. And But I did not really got into this like <laughs> with a fixed opinion on it. I think that actually happened by accident when I launched my, my first uh, framework website for my own website. And this was in, I think, January this year. And I just see, I just saw like a huge wave of people liking it a lot. And then so for some reason, not really sure why, because I have created like two, two templates already last year. But for some reason that there came this idea, oh, why not selling or try to sell my own website? And of course, there is like a real danger in this because right now actually i think it's 150 people have the same website that i have and that's maybe something that is a little bit weird in the beginning but then i realized that maybe 
I mean, it's not so bad because I think the most important thing, of course, the website is important, but what is way more important is like your your personality or your personal brand that you're reflecting online, like on, on Twitter and stuff like that. And yeah, for so for some reason, this pattern actually, yeah, started to make really much like more sense. And I replicated it again for Things Supply, which was the first, or basically it was my, it was the backbone store for my canvas supply, which is like just my template marketplace, which just has my own templates on. And out of that, actually, yeah, supply was born. So same idea, different template, of course, way more niche because there are not so many people who actually build a shop or an online shop and that on Framer and the Lemon Squeezy. So it's really niche, but still already has, I don't know, sold about maybe 20 times. I don't know. So it's quite fine because the goal for me is not to make as many sales as possible in the short term but more having a big library of really good products for the long term. And yeah, then I just, I'm not really like applying this concept to all of them. So like links, for an example, is, or also Billify. So like the two newer ones, they are both, let's say, <laughs> they came just out of imagination. So no mm -hmm. real use case that I had in, in mind and also did not use. Are those performing well? So they are like... Of course, also way cheaper. And uh, yeah, I got a, a few sales every week of them, but of course, because they are like maybe four times cheaper than the big ones. Yeah, they would need way, way more sales to compete with these other ones. And so I'd say Dash Folio is still crazy selling nearly every day, which is, yeah, it's really crazy. That's so awesome. <laughs> this is, uh, yeah, something I never expected in the beginning. And, uh, but yeah, so that this is just my goal to actually yeah, build like a decent amount of really good templates in all kind of niches. And uh, yeah, like just having a quite wide range in the end. I love that you have gone so far into it that you've been able to number one, build your own brand. But like you said, even though you're selling your own templates that you've used for yourself, Everyone already knows this is Cedric, right? Everyone already knows this. And it's okay if they literally steal your work because you're selling it to them. You're giving it to them for money. <laughs> so you benefit in the end of them stealing your work. And then it creates that brand awareness around everyone's, wow, that's a really cool thing. I think I've seen it before. And they, oh, it's Cedric's thing. Cool. That's awesome. I wanted to talk about the course building. Yep. Is, in your opinion, the course building and these resources, these framework resources, are these sustainable for the income? It really depends on, because like the number one aspect that changed, like from not making a living of those resources and now making a living were actually based on my social or Twitter growth. Because what I'm, what I think that when you just load up a template, maybe on, on framer.com, I'm sure it will sell. If it's good, it will sell a decent amount of times. What I see, and that's really crazy. What I see from the sources that visit my template store, nearly like maybe 70, 80% is coming from Twitter. So if you're not seeking for a distribution method that is different than from the framer online shop or on the marketplace, I think it's really hard to make much money with that because of course you do not really need to run ads or so, but I really think that it's also possible without. And I'd say right now, because the course is quite new and also had a more, like really a lot of traction in the beginning, but like last month, I'd say when we talk numbers, that was around maybe 7k just oh, templates wow. and courses so wow this is quite good the templates they they vary a lot so like they're really one someday there there's no sales and some days there are many sales and also this is directly related on how much i post and how much of good tweets that i got 
And that's why consistency is really important here because one tweet can make a huge different and uh, difference and actually, yeah, bring you in some more sales. And for the course, I don't know. So the course was basically done because so many people started to approach me when I started posting my first template sales, yeah, like template sales, which were really, which were actually higher. So like in February, I launched that fully, I made maybe 5k only with these templates or with this one template. And of course with time, like all that decreased a little bit, but still also, yeah, did not really launched a big template since a few months. So I think you will need to keep creating and launching templates to keep also your own momentum up. And for the course, I think could be the same. I'm not sure if it's okay. I'm adding a new lesson every week, although it's maybe not important to know for my audience. So for the course, my strategy is a little bit different. It's more like trying to keep the course like always relevant for its information, uh, obviously, but then of course, also trying to add, and that's what I'm currently doing, add more free resources for people who are maybe not yeah, so decided what they should do. And then also like extending my, my own newsletter and uh, yeah, with the newsletter, the guides and the course, trying to build some kind of knowledge base where people will also find free information, but also of course paid information in case they want to pay for it and go a little bit deeper. And uh, yeah, that's basically the strategy of keeping the course relevant, but I think it's definitely way harder than just shipping a new template every month and talking about it. And because it's also my first course, this is something that is really, really hard and not so easy because basically I have no idea what I'm doing and just trying things out. And yeah, as it was with the templates have, a year ago. Did you have any concerns that the course might not succeed? Oh, definitely. I suffered quite a lot. And I think that I also wrote that in my last newsletter about imposter syndrome. So that I, I definitely had many moments also while creating the course. If it's good enough, what I'm actually creating here, then I'm not so really comfortable talking to. Now that's also, I did not really, the course is not, it's not about recorded videos. It's really only audio. And, but I think that's also fine because the topic is more like there's nothing that is visual or visually important that needs to be shown. So it's totally fine that it's audio. But for me also as a first timer, when it comes to courses, I had a lot of thoughts, maybe of, I don't know how my voice sounds when people are actually listening to that, or I don't know, is that information even valuable in the end or how the hell I'm going to price it? It's really the course is maybe 99% of uncomfortable stuff and 1% of yeah things that I know, okay, they work well. So it really was like new waters for me as, as well. And yeah, maybe I think for a solopreneur, it's really hard to tell if something is going to succeed. And that's why we probably need to try it out and see how it goes, tease a little bit and listen to the echo and stuff like that. And I think so that's really important if you're into creating something as an individual, try to go out there and ask people how, what they would think of it, put the idea out and see what happens with it. Because in the end, nobody knows, except you, you can pay like a huge, uh, yeah, pack of money to someone who does the research for you. But I think that's not really possible for many of us <laughs> and yeah, trying to build something in, in public and uh, listen what they think of it. Do you feel at all? Cause when I was starting this Pascal, there were days where I was like, shit, this really is hard. Not hard. Like it's complex and like you need like a physics degree to understand it, but hard, like you have to be consistent, not just on social media, actually with yourself to push through the mud and in a way try to overcome the obstacle of just thinking that it's worth it in the end 
because it's like the end is so far away. It feels like that to me a lot. And yep. when Pascal and I tried doing something what you're doing now, we we did a first little test run. For those who don't know, listening to the audio here or watching us on YouTube, Pascal and I hosted our own how to make a portfolio, how, how to design a portfolio that will get you the job on maven.com. We love yep. doing it. It was so much fun. We learned a lot. And what we learned was we had no audience, right? So you have an audience. You have a mm -hmm. huge advantage. Pascal and I are still trying to build that, right? Like we are just about to hit 600 subscribers on our newsletter. You've already hit that, which is awesome. Congratulations on that. But mm -hmm. it comes with this like very, like you said, imposter syndrome. But I think even more than that, it's yeah, this like even if you could overcome imposter syndrome, yeah, I can do this stuff. Is this stuff worth it? Like you mentioned before, do you ever doubt yourself? that you can get to the end of it? Or is it like something that you are like, yeah, I've already got in the bag. I'm, I know what I'm going to do. I have a clear set goal and I have a deadline and I'm going to get it. So I think there are different parts that or can be split in different parts. So the first one is of course, consistency. And what I did, I did not really set a timeline for it or like a deadline. I just want to yeah probably launch in june so that was like the main goal and so a first good tip is actually to tell your audience about it because then you have to commit to something and as soon mm -hmm. as you're as soon as you're committing officially online to something and it's written on twitter that this will launch then i think this will definitely put some more pressure on it but of course then you also need to check that it's not too much pressure. And so mm -hmm. I definitely also felt that pressure that, oh shit, okay, I now committed to it. I need to do it. And what I did is basically I did not focus on the end goal, but I've tried really to focus more on like finish maybe two lessons every evening or every day. And then the next day I did uh, another two or three. And then in the end, of course, there's this day coming where all the lessons are done and I can focus on, on the platform and on the distribution and on, on how to market it in the end. And I think these two tips like to commit to something, but still that it's, of, it's fine for you that you can also like make it work in the end. So it's not like too tight. And then of course, trying to, yeah, make the little steps. So try really to finish something. I don't know, 5% of a project each time you're working on it. And I think if you do these baby steps and in the end you have one big step and a final product, I think this is something that really helped me through the course because yeah, in the end, I had no idea how this will work out in the end. And I just knew, okay, I have to make a course because I am getting over flooded by people asking me a thousand questions every day and I cannot really help all of them. So like that was the main reason that I got so many messages as soon as I started like posting my success numbers, whatever figures, the things blew up. And I think and this was not really to show off, okay, who I make so much money. This was really more to show everyone, hey, if you really stick to something. And of course, specifically with framework templates, as an example, you can really make a living with it. And yeah, this was basically <laughs> the reason for the course to somehow outsource all that information that I have into a product that is accessible all the time for everyone. And because my time is limited, especially when I am creating new things and I do not really want to be distracted all the time by, of course, kind of people asking me things. And I, I love every single person that is following my journey, but I cannot really split my time to 5,000 people in the end. And so that, yeah, that was basically the reason for this course. And so I hoped that it has a success in the end, but I did not really knew that. And so I just tried to bring it step by step to an end and launched it. And I think it's still very niche, but I think it's doing fine. So I see that also like just as a digital product in the end, which will be here for a few years, whatever. And uh, yeah, trying to grow it or maybe extend it, but maybe also focusing more on maybe other topics. I don't know. 
Do you have a goal after these like courses, like something you want to attain? I know some people that they, they say that they're doing courses so that they can use that money for something else. And then they have a more sustainable thing in the future, or they just want to grow this kind of stuff. And then eventually that can just support them. I forgot the guy's name on, on YouTube, Ali something. He just makes courses uh, and he down. has YouTube. Or, yeah. yeah. So is there like a goal afterwards that you think, or are you still figuring that out? Not really a goal. So like I have some kind of like ideal case or let's say, yeah, just like a life that I imagine for myself and, but I'm yeah quite close to that, but it's like my dream life would be that my basic costs and living costs can be more or less covered just by my products. And then, yeah, I can work on these passion products or passion projects, which can also be, of course, client projects. But I think as soon as you're having like the living costs, like as soon as they're not an issue anymore, when it comes to earning money or earning a living first, then I think life gets way more like chill or relaxed. And maybe that's like a goal because I love creating this. And I will definitely also, yeah, continue in creating templates and products and uh, like all those small businesses, because that's just something I have a huge passion on. But still, of course, you have this pressure in the back of yeah, covering all your costs every month. And uh, yeah, that's maybe, but I, my plans are not really to have, I don't know, make a million a year and that's it. It's really, I want a sustainable cover all my costs with uh, yeah with good products that help people and then like to have some more time for really nice things and maybe in the end this could be whatever that i love doing and right now it is framer so that's why all my focus is there right now more or less what i what i like about what you said is you weren't like oh yeah i'm gonna create a billion dollars off of this course that's very unrealistic but you said like you said like this is like a kind of what i want to do i want to have i want to cover my basics and then probably get to a certain amount of money and then just be comfortable. And so many people don't realize that they could achieve that level of success, consider it successful and not have to go past that because there's more to life than just working. There's more to life than framework templates. I'm sorry, everyone, <laughs> but, <It is. laughs> but these things that you and I and others are doing, they're not necessarily going to rocket ship to the moon in, in money. They, it, they also do to. not really need to. They exactly. also they need to. People are very sad and depressed because they can't achieve an escape route of whatever situation they're in. Oftentimes, their basic necessities are they're struggling to, to meet. They're trying to get just their first job to cover that, but also just a job to support a family, or whatever. And that's, that's a lot of money these days. Why do you think so many people are, are like, they're almost like envious or jealous of people who are making courses and they put out hate content online? And what do you think that's all about? I don't actually, know. Before, before you answer that, do you actually get hate comments or anything on your, well, you do? I, I think, uh, yeah, I got a bunch of, also I have this help scout widget on the landing page and I got a few messages on there which are really negative and I don't want to explain everything, but they were basically quite negative. And I Can think you give an example, oof, like roughly Oh, I don't know really anymore. I think it's, it's just really like courses are shit and they're just money-making machine and gen wow. general courses. So it, yeah, maybe those people, I mean, they definitely are from the side that you just mentioned. So I think there are two sides. First one is definitely the ones that believe in courses. And the other one is, okay, no, courses are trash. You're not really learning anything from it. And it is really only a money-making machine in the end. Just to clarify, these were comments that were directed to you through your little chat that like you yeah. used for support. And were they talking about courses across the web or just your courses? Like they were phrased like more on general courses or that's what I understood. Should they purchase your courses? No, I don't think so. Somebody so they went to your website, said directly to you, basically go fuck yourself. You're making a course. I hate you. And then they <laughs> left. They didn't even, 
So wait, they're not even a client. <laughs> if, but if they would be a customer, it not would not really make much sense because why hate it? And also the email that were always because I'm what I then did, I tried to reply them with a kind message. Okay, if it's nothing for you, you don't have to buy it. And that's fine. Nobody, mm -hmm. I'm fine with haters. But then often the email did not really work. And I always got a, an error message back for this email. Interesting. And for me, those are all like <laughs> just the wrong email already shows enough that they do not really have the balls to show up and tell me that in my face first. And second, I, I give a shit. So why ever? Yeah, I mean, there are more people who like it than dislike it. And so that's... Do you think it was like a competitor that was like trying to put you down, to discourage you from doing this kind of stuff? And like so much. Uh, many in total, there were like two or three. So not really crazy. Not that many. I don't know. I am. I don't think so because there's no one. I mean, there are, of course, a bunch of people who are actually doing a good money. But they maybe lack still a little bit on the audience. So maybe I'm right now, I'm because it's so niche, I think. And that's also why I was able to make myself a name in this niche because it was the first one. And I shared it also as the first one. And now I see many people who are trying to also replicate. And that's also fine for me because that's also what I tell them in my course. That they, they should show trust and things like that and show numbers if they are comfortable with it. And I see now really a few people doing that and their numbers are quite well or quite good. And I don't know, people can talk. I'm not really listening or I am <laughs> listening, but I don't care. <laughs> right. And I'm like, just trying yeah. to help people with this business idea. I want to get them going and I don't want to make a million out of this course. I just want to make, yeah, I said a decent amount of income that I got some value back or some financial value back for the value I'm giving in the course. And that's basically it already. For me, this is just like a medium of teaching people step-by-step step what I did. And so it's nothing more than a step-by-step -step guide of these six months that led me into this journey and end up where I'm right now. You have to filter out criticisms and negative feedback. That's a really important thing. People confuse those two. Clear, clearly, you don't get that much negative feedback or criticisms. Not yet. <laughs> no. I think the longer the course will go on, you'll start to see some more. Hey, I didn't expect it to be like this. Whatever. But what's interesting about what you said was you created this. What's the name of your newsletter? It's called Creative, uh, Creative Prosperity. 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 Yep. Creative Prosperity, which is a great newsletter. Everyone sign up for it. Sign up for ours too at like, shaping.design, yeah. but also sign up for <laughs> Cedric's. But <laughs> thanks a lot. It's yeah, no, we'll put all this in the show notes. Everyone can find the, the thousand links that are going to be there for this episode. <laughs> but it's it's interesting to see others open up and talk about this stuff. How do you feel about designing and building in public? For me, this was maybe, of course, next to growing an audience. It is, of course, this goes hand in hand. But for me, it was definitely the most rewarding thing that I could start doing about, yeah, not even a year ago, a little more than half a year. I am practicing it maybe since last summer when I, or maybe it's a little more, let's say one and a half years or maybe two years when I started to like just post regularly and also like more on Webflow stuff because I saw that there's a lot of Twitter potential in growth there. Not as much as it's with Framer right now, but I always try to like just share and also like also share something that is just work in progress and just share that with my audience. Because in the end, what this does is nothing else than building credibility, but also showing what you're working on right now and also giving like sneak peeks or yeah, just excitement onto something. And uh, yeah, I started doing this, I think on my first framework template. So this is, oh. yeah, I don't know, easily one and a half years or one, at least a year back oh. for maybe one and a half years, I think. And there I just started to post some things and tagged framer in it. And they, sometimes they reposted it 
And I think that's also where was really good leverage in the beginnings. So next to building in public, it's also important to share things that also create engagement because we want to attract more people in signing up or more people in following. Then it's just important that you're either sharing something with value when it comes to learning something or information. But the other way around, of course, also, yeah, like visual stuff because people or maybe also <laughs> definitely designers love visual stuff as well. And yep. so combining those two aspects and sharing helpful but also inspiring things, I think that definitely changed everything and maybe even let me grow that much as I am right now. And then I just continued. I'm sharing sneak peeks of everything I work and I just see that this works really well and attracts many people. And so definitely building public if you're comfortable with. Also like with the risk that maybe people copy you in the beginning before you're launching even. But that's, that's the risk all those startups that are not built in stealth yeah, go into. But definitely I think for, yeah, if, the, if, if you want to build a business and you're alone, think and also need to build an audience i think it's a really helpful tool that you can apply and also combine it with with posting every day and so if you're posting every day and yeah it's something valuable i don't think that it's no it's not caring anyone and i think yeah if you start doing this you will definitely grow and i think just never stop that's the <laughs> disadvantage because I think as soon as you stop doing it, things will stand still one day. And so we got to keep it going consistently. Yeah. Do you recommend others create their own courses? <clears throat> I think if you're having like really niche knowledge and experience of something that could interest a lot of people, definitely. I'm a huge believer of courses. I took several courses. Um, I also took several courses when it comes to earning money online. And so mm -hmm. as an example, I learned a lot of Jack Butcher, which is, I think, good friend of Traff. And so his, one of his courses, which is, I think, build once and sell twice. That actually made me click in my head that, yeah, it's not so hard to actually make money on the internet. And this was basically, yeah, roughly three years ago. And of course I had a long journey in building an audience. I think it, I even took maybe a year until things took off a little bit. And so definitely, so I'm a huge, huge believer of creating a course, but also like buying a course and learning from that person, because I think there's nothing more valuable than personal experiences that a person mm. went through. And is sharing. And I think I would even say that most, if a course is done well and it's coming from the right person, I think this is definitely even more worth than traditional schools. So it could be that in the future, yeah, that there are more people or more individuals creating a course and then there are other, people's, other people that are actually learning from it and applying the knowledge. Do you think, though, that there's going to be like an oversaturation of courses? Because everyone then has their own course, but not all of them are going to be good. How do you know it's good and bad? I guess those will be sorted out over time. But if everyone has their own course, is anyone actually doing any work? This is, I think this is definitely binded directly to your own audience or ecosystem. Because someone who is not really knowing me will never buy a course of me. And so <laughs> I, ho I, hope, I hope they do. So you make the money, but I, I don't think that's also not my, like, that's not how it's supposed to be because how it's supposed to be is that someone, I don't know, sees me online, maybe sees me on this podcast and think, okay, that's a nice guy. And maybe checks out my profile and sees, okay, hey, okay, he landed a few nice successes. Maybe his information is trustful and then maybe buy a course, but it should not be. And that's, I think that's when it comes to this distribution part. And that's, I think, no matter what you're building, even if it's a framework template, if it's a Figma template, if it's whatever, if it's a course, you always need to distribute it in some way. And if it's the way 
through Twitter, it is directly limited to your audience. And this is also for me, my course is definitely also limited to my 5,000 followers because those maybe have seen something I'm posting every day and maybe in a few weeks or months, they trust me and they eventually buy this course from you. But I don't think that someone lands on Google, searches through, I don't know, frame courses to create templates, lands on my website and buys it instantly. So that's not like the how it's normally done. Maybe there are some guys that are doing this, but I think it's really like limited to your audience. And so you can think of this like a universe. So I don't know, a creator or someone who has a course is like in the center. And he always has a limited amount of, or does not have to be limited amount, but can be like in the moment, it is definitely just the people who are there, who are looking, who are watching. And of course this grows with time. But in this exact moment, it's always a limited amount of people who are watching. And I think this is the same when you want to sell them something, you will always have this limited audience. And if you think like that, there won't be really a saturated market because of course there can be many creators and maybe some of them will never make it, but still they are all, they all have their own universe and yeah, they're selling their information, their experience to this universe. And I think we'll see. It depends, of course, on the topic of a course. But I would say as long as you're having something relevant and as long as you have experience with it, I don't think that there is something saturated here. Because also, like as we see it in, in Framer right now, we have, we have Traff who has a course. Then we have Nandi who is working on a course. And I think... There are one of one or even two more that are creating a course or created They're one already. On one. Definitely. Yeah. And so I don't think that this is a bad thing because firsthand they have their own audience. Mm -hmm. Second, they're all individual people. So they also have individual experiences also with Framer. Oh, sorry. And they also teach something different. And so maybe someone likes Traff more, maybe someone likes Nandi more. And they automatically buy that course or the other one. I think with that, uh, yeah, I don't think that this will be saturated one day. Maybe like the only chance is that the tool is getting less popular or something like that. And of course, then mm -hmm. the courses automatically also get less popular. And maybe one day they just uh, die because nobody is, is, uh, is buying it anymore. But I think also that's fine because then new ones arise. And... Yeah, maybe that, that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, no, that answers the question. <laughs> Let's see. If you could work for or design anything, who would it be or, or what would it be and why? Hard one. So like a goal that I have or that would be nice is to create some kind of software myself. So a real working good tool that is helping people to do whatever. But I don't really have a definition of that. But that's something like, because I'm more of a person that, I don't know, I just like the challenges of creating a business and having the risks on my own shoulders. So I'm not really into, okay, I'm going to work for Apple now, or I'm going to work for Humane now, which would be also nice. But for some reason, I'm not so the nine to five person. And, but one day, maybe, I don't know if it's, if that's going to change, but I think definitely what I would love is to create some, like a masterpiece of software that I designed. I think that's definitely also on my list. Currently like lacking a good developer friend or I have yeah, a few ones, all? but some <laughs> of them, yeah, some of them are not really, let's say on this level yet as it would be needed. But maybe, yeah, one day I'm also making connections with that. And then it's uh, it's time for that. But yeah. Yeah. If you find someone, let me know. <laughs> I, I, I will. <laughs> it's hard to find a developer that like, that yeah, is. I trust you enough to work on your idea. Why don't I just work on my own idea? It's, it's always I get it. a hard topic. But there are quite a lot of design founders or founders that were designers. Yeah. I'll never you, say never. <laughs> is there any one of those design founders that you look up to? 
from a entrepreneur perspective i would definitely say like folks like dylan from figma or even even the framer guys my coolnet and you are both are great and really kind guys I really had nice conversations with them. And I think they also they also have a, a big piece of my success is actually, yeah, I think they're on there thanks to them. Mm. And I would say, yeah, those are right now at least, yeah, a few people that I'm looking up to who yeah, are just changing the world of design every day. And uh, yeah, that would be cool maybe one day. Every podcast that we do, we are basically asking questions about how that person, our guest, you, is basically shaping the world of design, our world of design. And you just mentioned a really great question, a really great point over there just now. And I want to open it up to you because we always end every episode with the same question now. How has the world of design shaped you? I would say it definitely shaped my career, like my path. And also like my interests, but imagine there's no Figma or no Sketch or no Framer or no Webflow. We would still definitely, I don't know, design in Photoshop or in Fireworks from Adobe, which would be weird. And some kind, those technologies also shaped the way I built, but also the way I went and also are directly related to where I am right now. So I would say it's always yeah, two-handed or a, a two, yeah, just like having both perspectives. But I think definitely technology, because I'm also really like a technology versed person, definitely, yeah, shaped a lot of what I do daily. But yeah, maybe <laughs> hope that is. Has, it, has growing up in the design world changed you for the better has it like changed your outlook has it changed your goals in life maybe yeah from the goals might has shaped a little bit like what i imagine of having my life up to and so i think definitely what you also maybe see in my design style is that i always keep things very minimal and simple and that's definitely not something that just came from me. And that's definitely something that influenced me or myself heavily in the last years and also influences my own life because I'm also like trying to live more minimal and stuff like that. And so that's definitely something where it shaped also like how I'm living my life. And so I would definitely say that design enriched my life in all ways. And I'm really happy to yeah, be in that space and surrounded by so many nice people. And uh, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you again for being on the podcast. We had a blast with you here and Definitely. I hope you get to come back. Yeah. Thanks for having me. <laughs> maybe, maybe you can uh, come back when you do your next course, your launch next course. <laughs> Not sure if I'm going to do any <laughs> other one. <laughs> but It's tough. It's never really say tough. never. It is so yeah. tough. Never imagined yeah. that. <laughs> cool cool all right man appreciate it all right thank you very much